We're looking 2 Timothy 2, 8 through 15. And uh, just would bring to remembrance that this is a letter to an individual. And the big thing is continuing in the faith. And uh, this section we're here is sort of back to basics. Paul does that any time he perceives a, a threat, especially false teachers, back to basics. It reminded me of the football coach. You know, any time the, the football team uh, messed up big time, it was, let's go back to the basics. These are the basics. And just over and over again, the repetitiveness of, of basics. And so he says, remember Christ Jesus, raised from the dead, descended from David. This is my gospel for which I am suffering, even to the point of being chained like a criminal. But God's word is not chained. Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they too may obtain salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Here is a trustworthy saying, if we died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we disown him, he will also disown us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot disown himself. Keep reminding God's people of these things. Warn them before God against quarreling about words. It is of no value and only ruins those who listen. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a workman who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. Father, may the word of my mouth, the thought, the meditation, the heart of all here today be acceptable or in the name of Jesus become acceptable. You alone are our strength, our redeemer. Amen. Again, the idea is back to basics. And, and the first three words pretty much covers the book. Remember Jesus Christ. Any gospel that does not have at its core Jesus Christ is not the true gospel. Now he gives a summary. Now Paul likes giving summaries of the gospel. He also likes quoting and he's also going to quote uh, probably an early hymn or an early poem uh, and he says it's a quotation by using the words here is a trustworthy saying and then he gives this quotation the rest of 11, 12, and 13. But at this early part, it's, it's a summary. Raised from the dead, descended from David. Now, this is very similar. I'm, I'm just looking up one, Romans 1, 3, and 4. Regarding his son who, as to his earthly life, was a descendant of David and who through the spirit of holiness was appointed the son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead. That's Romans 1, 3, and 4. Um, not all of 4, it's 4 a. But the point is, he tells you which Jesus Christ. There are false Jesuses. And, and so he wants, to, he wants us to have this twofold standard. It's the Jesus who knew the resurrection bodily. It's the Jesus who was promised in Hebrew Scripture as the son of David. And, and uh, it has to be meeting that criteria. Um, my mother suffered with mental illness most of my life until she passed. And I remember visiting her once in the mental health ward of a hospital in Memphis. I guess I was eight, maybe nine. And Daddy took me into this locked ward where mama was and uh, they talked and I wandered around and talked to the <laughs> patients and uh, a slender black man with the most calloused hands I had ever seen ever experienced came up and shook my hand handed me a card and said I'm Jesus Christ this will get you into heaven. Mm. And he was referencing the piece of paper, and I looked down, and it was, 
you know, part of a <laughs> something he had torn that I'm sure he found in the garbage can. But now in his mind, he was saying it as authentically as he could. And you think, well, he's a nut. Well, yeah, mm-hmm. but not all of them are in the mental health ward. And, and uh, there are other Jesuses. And specifically, people will refer to him as a good teacher, a rabbi. Um, I remember uh, spending time in prison in Kentucky in Edible at the maximum security prison. The um, Muslim inmates referred to him as the prophet Jesus. Well, technically, he is a prophet according to scripture. That was one of his offices. Moses said, there's a prophet coming uh, after me that's like me, and we Christians believe that's Jesus. And so when I would talk to the Muslims, I would refer to the prophet Jesus. But it wasn't the same Jesus because they didn't believe uh, in the resurrection, in the bodily resurrection. They did not believe that Jesus was the fulfillment of God's promise as contained in Hebrew Scripture. Of course, they didn't believe in Hebrew Scripture. They were taught by Muhammad that it had been corrupted over the years and that the true Hebrew Scriptures were, in fact, the Quran. But that's getting off the subject. Meet these two criteria. It's a handy way to measure. Is it the Jesus of the resurrection? Is it the Jesus as has been promised historically in Hebrew Scripture? If it meets that criteria... If the central focus is the person of Jesus, who is the Messiah, Christ is a title, Christos, anointed one, the one God chose, then if it meets that criteria, it's the gospel. Paul says this, this is my gospel, for which now he he talks about the gospel. This is my gospel for which I am suffering, even to the point of being chained like a criminal. Notice what he doesn't do. He doesn't call himself a criminal. He says, like a criminal. But God's word is not chained. Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they too may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Two things there. God's word is not chained. It's an important thought. Uh, I remember as a young preacher thinking that I had to get to the right church to make a difference. Uh, My first appointment as a full-time pastor was to Harvey, Kentucky. (laughs) And, you know, I thought, what in the world am I, you know, uh, four years college, three years graduate school, two years postgraduate work, and here I am in downtown Harvey, Kentucky. <laughs> and I saw that as being chained. Paul is saying the gospel is, is not chained. It wasn't chained for him in prison. Uh, it's not chained for any believer. The gospel is free. If I had look at, looked at the opportunity instead of the circumstance, I would have been a lot more successful in sharing the gospel. I kept coming up with, you know, this is not a place to be able to share the gospel. And uh, uh, that was totally wrong. God's word is not chained. Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect. Now, he's saying here the gospel entails suffering. Uh, The gospel means suffering. It meant Jesus' suffering, and the one who suffered on the cross for us told us, take up your cross and do what? Follow. Go the same way I'm going. And so you've got this idea that... uh, uh, we're not exempt from suffering. Now, that's totally opposite what you hear in many of the gospel presentations today. You know, accept Jesus and life will be fine. And to be honest with you, some of that was present when I made my public profession of faith at a Billy Graham event. It was not a full crusade. It was only a three-day event. But he preached, and on the second day, I went down and publicly professed Christ. But there was a little bit of that idea that, you know, uh, 
you do this and everything will be okay. Well, in the long-term sense, in the longest-term sense, yes. Short-term sense, though, uh uh-uh. And that's one reason I I so violently object to uh, the rapture theology that's escapist. You know, the world is getting bad, but I'm fixing to fly away. And, and, and it's escapism. It's an early form of, it's, it's like the early form of Gnosticism. You know, I'm not going to go through all the bad stuff. That was taught in China and was reading an article the other day, the Chinese Christians uh, reconnected with the church that, that had originally reached out to them with missionaries. And the Chinese Christians were so angry because they were told that they were going to be raptured, but they went through the tribulation. And when that happened, they had to go back to the original source, the text, the Bible, and reread the text and realize that the rapture had not, in fact, been promised in Scripture, that it was something that was a variation of the rapture. that was promised, and that is the second coming. The rapture is a secret coming of Jesus, and yet the Bible says very clearly that when Jesus does come, every eye will see, every tongue will confess. So this rapture theology um, needs to, anything that says you're going to escape suffering. I mean, come on, how, how long did we spend this morning sharing burdens? Everyone in this room. Now, we weren't complaining. Bible says, bear one another's burdens and thus fulfill the law of Christ. When we get together, when we talk about what's going on, especially if it's a concern, what we're doing is we're sharing burdens. And that fulfills. But my point is, we all got burdens. Every one of us. Now, what does Paul say about burdens? We mentioned this once in weeks gone by, Colossians 1 and verse 24. Now I rejoice in what I am suffering for you. And I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. Now, I remember that from the King James, I bear in my body. You know, um, was Christ's work on the cross incomplete? I can't stand that idea. I hope not. I hope not. I can't stand the idea that Christ's work, but yet he talks to something, and and again, hooking back to the idea that Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me, suffering, the call to, to a life that would include suffering. I'm not saying intentionally going out and find suffering, but The life that includes suffering, obviously, is the calling of Jesus himself. But what is it? And I think Paul's getting at it, but he might be using words that could be misconstrued. We're appropriating, we're taking the work of Christ, and we're incarnating it here now. You and I collectively, and all believers, are the physical presence of Jesus. We're the body of Christ. And as the one Jesus was crucified, his body still displays that. I'm not saying that it's lacking. I'm not saying that the cross wasn't complete. But the outreach of the cross is still going on. The evangelism by the body of Christ still being willing to suffer for others, that's evangelism. If I'm willing, if I go and live in a community and suffer with that community, that's sharing the gospel on the deepest level like Jesus. You know, in James 2, it says, yeah, and it all joy, my brothers, when you go through these uh-huh. trials and suffering. I'm still learning that one. I, am I too. don't need help. <laughs> yeah. that's, it's, hard to be, it's hard to be joyful. It is, it is. Uh, superintendent spoke to that Sunday uh, <laughs> in the sermon at, at Charge Conference about being joyful. And I'm mm-hmm. thinking, oh my. 
I'm, I'm not there yet, but I'm, but again. But it's not, because of this, it makes us stronger. It makes us stronger. It increases faith. It allows other. Don't ever think the world is not watching you if you proclaim Jesus as your Savior. The world is watching you, and what you do with that really makes a difference. And uh, I endure everything for the sake of the elect. Who are the elect? Those that are called. Um, he says in Romans 4, uh, oh, mine just went blank. I hate that. <laughs> for those I foreknew, I predestined. And so God is, is calling people. And Paul is saying, I'm doing this. Is he saying, I know who the elect are? No. But he's saying that people will come to Christ. And I'm doing it because I know people will come to Christ. And my life, which includes my suffering and my willingness to be treated like a, a criminal, my willingness is going to make a difference. Fastest growing church in the world, fastest growing part of the body of Christ, not an individual congregation, I'm told is in Iran. And it, Iran. I heard that it was growing in just wildfire. Like groves. And it's, it's being led very much by women. Very much yeah, by women. Men can't live long <laughs> enough to provide any leadership. And thankfully, the Muslims are too dumb to realize that women can, in fact, be true leaders of the body. Uh, in, in a few short years, if, if current trends continue, the largest Christian nation on earth will be China which is going through terrible persecution right now. Mm -hmm. Terrible. And one of the early church fathers, Tertullius, said that it's the blood of the martyrs that is the seed bed of the church. Well, I, I know that we're beginning to see um, more attacks. attempts of, of persecution to sure. some degree in this country. How are we not suffering like China because we're democracy? Because how is that not happening to us now? I'm not sure I understand the question. Why are we not suffering like the Chinese or the Russians or the people in Iran? Or Maybe we are in a different way that we might be blind to. It's I'm more mental. Well, mental and... I remember two bishops in the church, in our church, talking, an American bishop to an African bishop, and this has been 15 years ago, I don't think a, a, a current bishop would do this because it is very self-glorifying. He said, uh, I want you to know that I and my people are praying for you and your people mm -hmm. in your poverty. To which the African bishop replied, and I want you to know that I and my people are praying for you and your people and your prosperity. It could be that the trap is there. One of the things I personally, this is not the gospel, but this is Earl's application of the gospel. One of the things I personally believe about the increasing uh, antagonism and open attack on Christians in America God's allowing us to go through a great shaking, shaking, and I think that the reason God allows that is not in any sense punishment, but is is order to strengthen in faith the whole count it all joy yeah. idea that if if our faith doesn't get strengthened, we're gonna die. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can, I can understand that firsthand. Yeah, we really are gonna die. Mr. Wesley taught a lot of things. Uh, one of the things he taught was on money, earn all you can, save all you can, give all you can, in the Methodist way led to such prosperity that within 100 years we were no longer the uh, mission church to the poorest. 
the most outcast. We were the pretend Episcopalians to the middle class America. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the world that my great grandmother raised her children, which included the two boys, Methodist preachers, the three girls, school teachers, they knew such prosperity that I could see in my grandfather's generation the falling away from pure Christianity and becoming the state religion of America, which for years the Methodist Church sort of functioned as the state church of America. And uh, thankfully, uh, now we really have to decide, do you want to be Christian? I mean, when, a, when one of the two major parties in America raises secularism as being the approved religion, mm -hmm and their national plank. Mm -hmm. You know that being Christian is no longer the publicly uh, approved thing to do. I think that prosperity, and that means, you know, we, we can do it ourselves. We don't need God. Mm -hmm. And that's where we're yeah, that's falling. Pride. And, and, pride. and well, it goes very much back into the Pauline theology. When I'm weak, yeah. then I am strong. Yeah. Because when I'm strong, I try to do it all myself. I really think that has a lot to do with it things does. right now. It does. I think, I think our, in some ways, our circumstances are actually more dangerous in an eternal sense. You know, they probably are. I guess when I think of persecution, I think of physical persecution because he speaks right. of chains and the Chinese are being physically persecuted. They're jailed, yeah. never to yeah. be seen again, and who knows what they're doing to the kids in Hong Kong. You know, I keep mm -hmm. going back to them, but they're being persecuted also. One of the articles this morning in reference to what's going on in China referred to what Chinese call as a voluntary re-education camp. <laughs> oh, wow. I'm thinking, how in the world can you say that with a straight? Voluntary. Oh, goodness. <laughs> <laughs> Their definition of voluntary oh, my. Mine probably is a lot different. Oh, my. <laughs> But there is this clear understanding of suffering, and it is so very different from what we in America think is normal and, and, and should be. You know, when I talk this way to the kids, it's in many cases the, the first time they've ever considered it, which to me is a joy because it means they at least finally did consider it as being a biblical point of view. because. You know, it's not coming across to them. Mm. I don't know what's being taught, but it's certainly not coming across to them that suffering is good, acceptable in the eyes of God. It's always a curse. Mm. Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect that they too may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Notice he's, he's, he's not saying I'm going to get saved by it. They too. He's, this is outreach. This is evangelism. Now he's quoting probably an early hymn. Here's a trustworthy saying, if we died with him, we will also live with him. That appears to be a reference to the baptism. You look at Romans 6 where Paul talks about being buried with Christ in baptism. Uh, 6, 5 through 11. You know, we will live with him. If we endure, we will reign with him. It's talking about a future gift. We will also reign with him, but it's obtained only by endurance. The biggest call that Paul gives is endurance. Keep going. Keep, you know, keep preaching Jesus. Keep focusing. And here's the, here's the implied downside if we disown him, he will also disown us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot disown himself. So God's integrity is going to remain no matter what. But our circumstance <coughs> and our relationship to God is changeable. Jesus says this in, in Matthew's gospel. If you acknowledge me before men, I will acknowledge you before the Father. If you don't acknowledge me, I will not acknowledge you. Question, can you lose your salvation based on those verses? <laughs> it the, sounds like it. It sounds like it, but 
if we are faithless, he remains faithful. Two biggest disagreements in the church in America today, not the two biggest, one of the biggest is can you lose your salvation? It's talked about for the sake of the elect, verse 10. It's talked about he remains faithful, verse 13. People that believe you cannot lose your salvation think that it's his faithfulness that keeps me. Then how do they handle uh, if we disown him, he will also disown us. Uh, this is before true salvation in some senses of being sealed. Once you're sealed in the Holy Spirit, you cannot lose your salvation no matter what you do because God's faithful. Obviously, I don't understand that because I can't explain it well enough. If we had a Presbyterian here, he could explain it better than I could, but that is one of the issues. All I know is my security is God remains faithful. The one thing I and the Reformed Church believe alike is God will never choose to reject me. God will never choose to withdraw from me. The difference is in the uh, Wesleyan camp, we do believe that if you say yes long enough, God will say, okay, I honor that. We don't know at what point that is. Nobody believes it's easy. Nobody will believe it happens one time. You know, I say, I stump my toe, say a dirty word that invokes the name of God inappropriately, and boom, I'm, you know, I have to get saved again. That has gone around, but that's not a legitimate theology. It's like that saying, you know, if, if you're not as close to God as you were yesterday, who moved? Who it's moved? not God. You know, yeah. he's still there. He's still faithful. And but, you know, that's based on feeling. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, as, as, as the prophet Jeremiah, the, the heart is deceitful above everything and desperately mm-hmm. wicked. Who can know it? And, of course, the implied answer is God is the only one that can know the human heart. We can't know our own heart. Well, that was in our lesson Sunday. <laughs> Sunday was a tough one. It, it was a, a hard tough day. lesson. Hard to, yeah. Yes. <laughs> but <clears throat> it, the gist of it was um, enduring to the end. Mm-hmm. That, that was the main focus. Now again, Paul's talking to Timothy, a young minister, but he's giving words here that if I could, I would give as the prescription to the church in America. Keep, verse 14, keep reminding God's people of these things. What he's not saying there is do it one more time. We're supposed to, that's supposed to be the essence of the message of the gospel for the rest of my preaching for the rest of my life. And, and uh, I was taught by my preaching professor that 90% of everything that comes out of my mouth in teaching, at least 90%, you should have already known. In other words, he's saying that over 90% of my job is just reminding you of what you already think. That is... Paul's giving the idea that this is the unifying effort. This is what holds the church together. This is our focus. And in doing so, we, we see God working. And so my thought is, if we don't see God working, we've lost our unifying focus. We've lost our, our core, our essence. Keep reminding God's people of these things. Warn them before God against quarreling about words. Now, That's basically saying put them on trial with God as being the judge. Warn them before God against quarreling about words. It is of no value and only ruins those who listen. All right, I'm a theologian. I've got to talk about that. (laughs) What words? Because Paul uses words. Paul is suggesting here that words that are not rooted in Scripture and in the scriptural view of salvation. Elsewhere, he talks about genealogies and discussion about angels. You know, there's, there's all kinds of ways of getting trapped here. My question is, earlier I, I mentioned predestination versus uh, free will. You know, you could lose your salvation or you can't lose your salvation. Are those words that I need to avoid? 
based on this. Warn them before God against quarreling about words. It is of no value and only ruins those who listen. Well, one of the ways you could consider it useless is if in my raising can you lose salvation, somebody starts questioning their salvation. I shouldn't have done it. Notice that before I finished talking, I pointed out the one thing everybody could agree upon. God is faithful. If, uh, in theory, as long as I trust God's faithfulness, I'm not going to find out if I can lose my salvation. So either way, both of us agree on enough to get somebody to heaven. Even when I raise to you a legitimate point of disagreement, I'm trying to bring back the idea of you can trust the gospel in either interpretation. The fact is, I actually believe, I actually wish what they believed were true. Last week, I uh, was listening to a Reformed theologian Old Testament professor. He presented once saved, always saved in such a manner that when he finished, I looked over at my wife and said something without any anger whatsoever. I said, uh, I hope he's right. Sure sure sounded good to me. I hope he's right. Don't believe it, but I do. Mm -hmm. You know, I would like to think that. Do your best. To, now, again, charge to an individual but any individual can hear this as a charge to themselves. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, who correctly handles the word of truth. What is the word of truth? It's what Paul's been sharing. Just keep coming back to this same essence. Keep coming back. Keep coming back. And then you're safe. All right, that's my take on the text. What are your thoughts? God has a plan that's fail safe. Yes. If you just accept it. Yes. That's what I get out of this. You can't lose if you just trust. Do, do it God's way. Very good summary. Tell me more of the prison period. Now, the reason I'm asking 